Well, I am looking forward to a very interesting and interactive dialogue on this topic. I'm Jill Christensen, and my work is with the National Education Association, which is the Education Union of the United States. Anyone a member? Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, very cool. The NEA does international work, and very much, I think it's easy for me to say I'm a practitioner of intercultural communication and mediation. But it's not what I deliver training on, ever. So you're it, you're the guinea pigs. <laughs> and it's actually going to be really dialogue and exchange and learning from how to do things. Because I could tell you what it's like to drive an 18-wheeler truck, a lorry, through the snow to get from here to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But it's a whole other thing to actually do it. <laughs> so <you're, laughs> we've got a practitioner trying to say how to do it. What I do know is that this afternoon we'll open up a lot of ideas, a lot of questions. And when we're dealing with the soft areas of intercultural communication and mediation, there's a lot of flexibility that happens. I'm going to share with you some generalizations, but there are always exceptions to those. And so keep that in mind as we, as we talk through this and work through this. In the course of this afternoon, certainly I want to acknowledge where I've gotten help along the road, beginning with my different international and intercultural living experiences, traditional Mohawk Indians, attending school in Denmark, teaching an alternative school in London, teaching expatriate kids in Colombia, and many other things. But also then very much want to acknowledge the education union leaders from around the globe that I work with now all the time, and how I've learned along the way. And then the folks with the Intercultural Management Institute who have taken these two different areas of cross-cultural, intercultural communication, and mediation and try to, in fact, identify common ground. Well, we've got these two today, and we're actually putting in the lens of education, too. So get ready for the ride. You ready? Let's go. All right, so you all know who this young woman is. And truly, her statement has to do with power. The power of educators. The reason I got into the field of education was it had to do with, in fact, social justice, transformation, and really building in voice of those that you're educating, but also then so they can understand who they are compared to others in the world. And I also brought along, one other, in addition to Malala, one other postcard. Does anyone know who this man is? He's an Indian. Yeah, good start. You're right, so he, he advocates for kids' rights who are carpet workers. Kailash Satyarthi is, in fact, Nobel Prize winner with Malala this year. And what's profound about the choice of the Nobel Committee is that they chose, in fact, a young Pakistani female, an older Indian male. And in reality, though, their passions are the same and that is to ensure that children have access and voice, and particularly then are empowered by education. So this is for them. As educators, we have responsibility. And no matter where we are in the education realm, that responsibility comes in. I need to know who's in the room. And as Molly and I were connecting online before this workshop, I said to her, this is going to be a really cool conference, but I can't tell who's going to attend. So take a second, and if you hear something that applies to you, I want you to stand up. OK, ready? If you traveled more than five hours to get to this hotel, please stand up. They, any way you wanted to travel, even by foot. Thank you very much. If you traveled more than 20 hours to get to this hotel, please stand up. <laughs> In deep respect and appreciation. If this weather outside 
is the coldest that you've ever experienced in your lifetime. Please stand up. Okay. Obrigado. <laughs> Thank you. If this conference and the language I'm speaking right now is not in your mother tongue, not in the language that you grew up with in your home, please stand up. Thank you. Okay, if you work in education, stand up. Wow, we did it. Congratulations. Now, stay standing. If you work in higher education, stay standing if you work in higher education at a university college level. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you very much. If you work in early childhood education, please stand up. Woo, woo. Very, very cool. All right, and now, have a seat. If you have lived outside of your home culture, so let's say living is anywhere from four months on the shy, short side to anything longer. If you've lived outside of your home culture during your lifetime, please stand up. Cool. All right, thank you very much. That helps me as well as you just get an idea of who's here and some of the spectrum of who we are and the experiences that we bring into the room. Okay, so our role as educators then is of course to reach in a very responsible way and empower whoever it is that walks through the school doors or the preschool doors. And that's not always easy because there may be experiences of those children, children in families that are very different than our own, children with experiences very different. But that's really where our responsibility lies too. Final quiz, see the students there? They're actually very diligent students. Where do you think they are? What country do you think they're in? Asia. Asia. So as far as region of the world, Asia, does everybody agree? Yeah. US. US. These students are fluent Norwegian speakers. They live in Norway. This is a public school class in Oslo. We often have ideas, and we move right ahead with those ideas. And oops, wait a minute. My ideas are a little dispelled. It was actually the most challenging academic high school class, upper secondary, that I've ever seen. And it was all done in English. An English literature class, they were comparing 17 pieces of English and American literature and comparing it then to Norwegian history. It's amazing. Okay, so we're still moving. Often with culture, we think about an iceberg. Has anyone, if, is anyone familiar with this concept of culture? A few people. Anyone want to take a stab at it, what it is? We often operate on what we see. That visual cue, maybe what we hear. When in fact, there's so much more, so much more to that iceberg the values, the beliefs, and sometimes we don't know we've bumped into it until it's a crash, right? Yeah. We can deal with what we see, and we may bump into stuff up there too, like the Norwegian students. But really, when we look at culture and intercultural communication, this is where we really need to think about and to focus. So one of the models for comparing culture is this, to do and to be. Again, vast generalization, but different ways of being that occur within different cultures. Sometimes it's considered industrialized countries compared to developing countries. Sometimes it's more urban living compared to rural living also. But I'm going to provide you with a few different models through this session, just so you can kind of think about them. Kathy has, in fact, an email that she's going to read to us. So again, think about these things as she reads this. Status, individual achievement, individual action, equality, self-reliance, competition, class mobility, 
Ascribe status, affiliation, stability, inequality, reliance, cooperation, shame, and caste rigidity. Go for it, Kathy. This is from Elizabeth Mahiana, uh, Friday, February 13th, to Jill Christensen. Greetings. Dear Jill, how was your journey home after the 8th EI Africa Region Conference? It was so nice to meet you and to sit together in the conference room. I am sure you will remember me since I was sitting together with you in the conference room and sharing the proceedings. I was glad when you handed me your business card. It was kind of you, Jill. I am Elizabeth Mahiana, the woman representative of the Zimbabwe Teachers Association and am now representing Zone 6 in the EI Africa region. I am age 55 and am a mother of two. My firstborn child is a girl named Precious who is 35 years old. The second one is a boy named Wonderful who is 23 years old. I also have two grandchildren, Kuda and Kith. My husband Robert passed on in 2002 and that left me with the sad status of being a widow. I am a teacher by profession and am the principal of Chimana Primary School <laughs> in Chipping, a small town in Zimbabwe. I am a unionist and I enjoy gardening, reading, and listening to music. Going to church is also my hobby. I would also love to know more about you and your family. How are you, my friend? How is work? And how is America? Would love to hear from you soon. Lots of love, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Kathy. Sure. All right, so that was Elizabeth. It is a real email. And I wanted to bring it to you as a way to think about this variable of culture. She shared some of her affiliation, but also all kinds of things about who she is, how she connects. In a way, as an American, I was startled to get all that personal information, the names of her kids, how old they were, how old, about the grandchildren. Her husband died, she said. I was, you know, that's hard. And yet what she was doing was networking with me. Different than an American context as far as networking. How does it relate then the, the, to the to be and to do? And so every time that I meet Irene Adenusa from Ghana, she asked me about my daughter. Well, my daughter's 24, and it's not, if I meet you, it's not the first thing I'm going to tell you about who I am. She's important. But at the same time, it's not that public information about affiliation and connection. And yet, for her, that's the most important piece. And so to understand that people approach it differently. And there are different norms about what should happen in a professional context, too, whether we're talking about the, the profession of education or other business contexts too, absolutely. We operate in a cultural context and occasionally then we're meeting people who have a different context and then it's like, what? And to really think about that. I'm so glad that you want to talk because clearly this conference is full of people with incredibly rich experiences and together there's so much that we can do in the process. Yes, please. I'm coming from South Africa. Yes. And uh, perhaps I want to begin with um, an experience in the UK as a student. You know, coming from Nigeria, originally from Nigeria. In 1996, I was a student in England. And uh, I recall a very small grocery shop where I usually go to buy some stuff. And then each time I picked a few things and went to the till to pay, the young Indian woman would say, Thanks, love. Thanks, sweetheart. In, Ni <laughs> in Nigeria, it's not easy for a young lady to say to a young man, love, sweetheart. And for me, I started interpreting it differently, such that I would leave off the change. And then she would say, are you sure? I said, yeah. Until such a day, I thought I've built some trust. And then started making vocal appearance you know, to say about the hairs. And then she picked a face. And, and actually, picked and a face means what? Sorry? 
made a face, yes. Yeah, and then uh, she said, uh, I invited the police. She actually called the police. And then when the police came, the police said, what happened? I said, well, each time I came in here, she said, thanks, love. Thanks, sweetheart. And I thought she was inviting me. Because that's what it is from the southern part of Nigeria where I come from. When someone is making advances, which is not common anyway, it's something that it's an exclusive preserve for the men to see a lady and admire and say something vocally. You understand? Then back to the Zimbabwean. Don't you think yes. during the short encounter you had with her, she built some form of trust? Yes, absolutely. That, that enabled her to outpour her feelings through the email. So where is the role of trust in communication? The role, the role of trust is there, as well as in the openness to the people express themselves differently. So that if I were to be the first one to write to her, I would probably write, Dear Elizabeth, I was so glad to meet you in Nairobi. I was really glad for our conversations. I hope you returned well. Right. Now, even that I hope you returned well to home, to Harare, is in fact outside of my culture. Most Americans in a business context would never write that. So I've tried to kind of meet, meet her partially, but yes, it's because she had a positive feeling about the interaction and she wanted to grow it deeper. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But again, in, in a first email, I would not tell her about my marital status, my family, my age, or other situations of even my hobbies. Um, it would be going right to work and talking about the content of the conference that we were at or the work that she's doing in Harare or the projects that I'm working on these days. So again, very different ways of communicating, both meaning very good intentions. And yes, it all comes back to that building of trust and the interpersonal relationships and how you do that. And I think your example is superb of your own life story. <laughs> And I think as we talk about conflict mediation, what we need to understand is there could be small problems when those icebergs collide, or there can be very big problems that can include the law, that can include violence and other variables. Um, and so for us just to be conscious of that in, in the process today. And uh, we're gonna be doing two case studies as well as in a role play if we have enough time. And I will have to admit right now I made ones that were rather light, so they're not, they're not going to end in violence or any arrests. <laughs> but, actually, yes? Actually, actually, I didn't finish the story, because when the police came and they said to me, yes, what happened? Yes. I said, oh yeah, each time I came here to buy, and she says, thanks love, thanks sweetheart, you know, all kinds of things. And then the police said to me, well, what are you doing now? But I'm a student in London Metropolitan University. I said, can we, can, we, can we see your documents? And I said, okay, this is England for you. Go back to your room and continue with your studies. And that was exactly what I did for two years, made a good result, and went back to my culture. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, and I think so often we have so many examples from this country and others where misunderstanding and or cultural assumptions can immediately lead to violence or other trouble. And I'm very cognizant of that and aware of that, even though we're not gonna be talking about this. So you, obviously, if you're an educator now, you finished your studies. <laughs> Long time ago. Well done. <laughs> I'm actually a university professor now. Okay, thank you. I will say too, the valuing that we put on education, on family, on connections, how we are networked in our communities is very different. I want to show you a slide. This is research done by Gallup, which is one of the big polling organizations in the United States. And I actually extrapolated, this was, this was research on all African nations. Can you read it? Individuals that were surveyed on the importance of education, family or friends, worth ethic, or intelligence on, in fact, life success. And you see here in Ghana, education is most important, viewed as most important by Ghanaians for life success. 
Zimbabwe, education, but really family and that family connection. So there we are with Elizabeth making that connection. That whole variable of where the value is placed and at what point we make that decision. Family's more important. You need to be at home. We've got work here to do at home. You know, there's so much to be done here at home and connections and your relatives are coming. Forget school. Or then you've got exams. Now you are not going to be here when Uncle Obed comes to visit or Uncle Harry. You absolutely have to be in school. How we do those decisions is different. As we look at mediation, and sometimes it's just digging ourselves out of a hole rather than being a third party helping two parties that are not getting along. Much of it begins with self-awareness. What are my expectations? Okay, Monday morning, 8.30 a.m. If it's 8.32, you're late. All those pieces layered with culture and how we do it. It means dealing with a lot of ambiguity all the time if an educator is going to be cultural, culturally competent. I think it's very important to say, <clears throat> too, that differences in culture can happen within a country, immigrant families. But also then, as far as families who have lived in a country for years and years, but different regions of a country. So last night, I had a wonderful dinner conversation with um, a new neighbor who is in her 20s and arrived just last month from Nigeria. She'd never been out of the country, and here she arrives in this snowstorm mess of winter. And she was telling me that she's from the southern part of Nigeria. And with that, Yoruba tribe was sent for one year to teach in the north. And she was shocked that whenever she was teaching, her field is microbiology. So she was teaching secondary school, a boys' school. So again, for those kids to get to that point to teach biology, it was great. And, and you know, I started asking her questions about her experience. She said what blew her away was, and again, she'd made it through university. She'd interacted with people from across the country of Nigeria, is that if she were sitting at her desk doing her work, and a student came to ask her a question, he would get down on his knee and be lower than her head as a sign of respect. It freaked her out. Again, one country and differences that exist based on, in fact, regionalisms and culture, multiple cultures within one you know, larger nation setting. So it's important to note. So self-awareness very much builds with that. When we look then at a model of mediation, We also then get to that place of creating dialogue and facilitating a conversation. Yes? You know, it's quite interesting because uh, it might not be as simple as you've just presented it. Because in the UK, I was coming from a system where if you want to ask a question in the lecture rooms, you must recognize the title of your lecturer, doctor or professor. Now I find myself in the UK where you have to call John or Mary or Jude and then put your question across. And I wasn't able to do that. In fact, my customers didn't know I had anything in my head until the results came out. Because I wasn't speaking, I wasn't saying anything. Because I wasn't able to call my lecturers by their name. For instance, a famous sociologist, Alistair Ross. Then I say Ross or Alistair. I wasn't able to do that. It was quite difficult for me to do, because I could have said, Prof. Ross, could you please explain? That's how we were brought up. Mm -hmm. But they didn't like that. And so I wasn't able to ask, in fact, to interact for a whole year. I was like, you know, very, very, very lonely in a marketplace. Right. And sometimes. We kind of think, well, gosh, why didn't somebody tell me what, what was expected? But that's truly that underneath side of the iceberg that until you bump into it, you do not know what you're encountering. But absolutely different traditions and expectations within education systems. In mid-January, I was in both Norway and Finland visiting schools. And there it was really, I thought it was refreshing, but many people would find it very shocking. See little children running up to the principal saying, Maria, Maria, I need your attention. A child interrupting adults. 
a child speaking to the principal of the school, the headmaster, mistress, by her first name. Again, different norms and traditions, and it's until you encounter it that you're not aware of it. Yep. Please. Um, how do you deal with generalizations? Because I feel it's so easy to put a country in a box. So I have people that went to Brazil and they're like, oh, I know everything about Brazil and the Brazilians. And I'm like, that's not necessarily true. You have a diverse, like, how do you do? Because the countries are so diverse. Absolutely, they are. That? Absolutely, they are. And I think maybe one of those first ways of doing it is saying, my experience here, rather than, oh, all the schools in Norway. So if I was anywhere near that right now, I apologize. Uh, what I did understand was that's the norm in Norwegian and Finnish schools, a first name basis for everyone. But I think it's really important to be careful on that, of generalizations. And really, that's where this is in a way nebulous conversation and challenges of cultural competency because there is so much fluidity and difference. You know, we've not even added into the variables as far as discrimination within education settings. And then, you know, whether we're looking at gender issues, whether we're looking at religious differences and other kinds of things. So there's many, many layers of this complex mess. <coughs> and to be very careful as far as that too. Thank you. So dialogue and facilitate conversation. So again, that's where it's a chance to be asking good questions. That third piece of mediation is developing pathways for change. Often it's called win-win. How do we find a mutual concern and basically a mutual solution that's going to help us out? And clearly, this is a 90-minute workshop, so this is fast. So it's really just very general ideas that I'm giving you now about how it all fits together. Does it work OK? Let's keep going then. So I like this concept of self-check, checking your own assumptions. What am I doing? And then again, the impact of culture. And so as you came up with the questions that you would ask, very much these were coming out. Cultural expectations. Again, within this fuzzy stuff, sometimes it's trusting your intuition, too. And then the curiosity, asking the questions, well, what did you mean by, when you did this, what did it mean? So the role of a mediator, then, would be make sure, making sure if you're that third party, let's say it's two students who are struggling with each other, make sure that everyone feels understood and heard Sometimes that means rephrasing. So you mean he really pushed you into the snowbank? How did that feel? Being ready that, in fact, there may be emotions that come out. And then a safe space. Sometimes that means two separate meetings with colleagues. Um, a little bit about my work. We have colleagues in the Caribbean who have been really struggling with each other different national education unions, and they are not in agreement on an issue of a vote that happened two years ago. What's been best in, in getting to solution on this is shuttle dis diplomacy. First talking to one party, then going and talking to the other. <coughs> talking to somebody else connected over this side, over this side. So that in fact it's probing and answering questions until in fact there might be visibility it might be possible to bring them together in the same room, which actually happened two weeks ago. And then to get to that point of, OK, how do we get out of this mess together? You know, so really those steps, sometimes it's safer to do it individually rather than pulling them together immediately. And again, back to the comments and questions about sometimes conflict can get really messy and really difficult. Separate may be the safest way to begin sometimes. So getting from the me to the we, identifying those issues, brainstorming ideas. Well, what would work better for you? Evaluating the options. Well, we could do this. We could do this. But you know what? This really would work much better. And then getting, in fact, that buy-in. So if you are a mediator, it's not your place to come up with the solutions. 
It's in fact in dialogue and discussion with the parties impacted and their ideas that come with it. And again, just like we know whether it is peace in the Ukraine or ceasefire in the Ukraine <coughs> or other things, you've got to get that full buy-in of parties. Otherwise, it just doesn't last. Also cultural. Emotion exists. And yes, it's cultural. And to the, the extent that you actually share your emotions with coworkers and what, the, what that means, whether you felt like you were totally outside the situation, that you were actively discriminated against, whatever. Emotion is a part of it. And to understand, though, that there are different cultural expectations about what is appropriate in the expression of emotion. In the workplace, absolutely, <coughs> absolutely. Okay, can we move Bonita? All right, Bonita, Bonita. What questions would you ask for John? Uh, could you explain the, the circumstances behind what you wrote to the staff? Beautiful, absolutely. So it's the curious starting point. Yeah. Help me understand better. Mm -hmm. And that's your bridge. Yep. In the back corner? Well, we'd like to know why uh, Benita just decided to quit, because that means at every point she will quit, even if she goes to another team. OK. So maybe she should toughen up. Is that what I'm hearing from you? <laughs> to understand. And maybe there had been other things that, that had happened with there's, that employer earlier. There's something in the second paragraph here. Yes. You know, these two, Bonita and Raj, actually gave suggestions. And uh, they did not, they gave new ideas, they produced new ideas. And they told them to wait, uh, right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 they gave suggestions that they, they, after much discussion on the process, the two newcomers raised concerns and suggestions and suggested a new suggestion for the analysis to be considered. Isn't it? Okay. Well, what we have at the second to bottom paragraph, though, is that once, in fact, our buddies Hassan and Awara got together, they, in fact, stated, once they reported to the staff, the new UNESCO data that Bonita and Raj had shared, that they had incorporated. Yeah, but uh, when they... The, the, I, I will uh, actually compliment Bonita for expressing her emotion and, uh, you know, find how she can go back to the team and uh, maybe work on, on the particular. It sounds as if the two first early uh, participants walked alone just to finish. They didn't follow the process process is a major issue here. You know, when people make suggestions, wait. You know, the, the, the CEO the, the CEO is looking for, you know, present it quick, quick. Then we convene all four of them and uh, make sure that there's a buy-in or, you know, just for the other two to go out. And right. Without. And uh, again, let me go back to the emotional stuff. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, emotion is not well expressed here. In this culture, emotion, we, we keep our emotion behind. People are afraid of expressing their emotion in the workplace. You know, we, you know, adults, and uh, in most developed, uh, you know, the, three th uh, the, the uh, two third of uh, the world, do express emotion. And here we don't like to express emotion. Right, so there are different feelings and emotion, but you would begin by validating Bonita's thoughts. Yes, I'll validate her emotion and uh, agree with her that she was excluded and then start working her back to the team. Because if you just. Um, but really, all of this begins with whether it's conflict that you're in the middle of or then that you've been asked to help fix, because fix people want, starting with those questions, open-ended questions that, in fact, can explore the history, the situation, and how you felt. 
Because if the end of the day, what we need is a product from four people on time, then in fact, that's really critical. I really appreciate the deep, good thought that you put into this. And I think it's real. It's not easy working with anybody besides myself. <laughs> and yet reality is when I can, it's so much better. And clearly, whether it is a school environment, whether it's a university environment, whether it's community organizing that we're doing or the negotiation at the World Education Forum in Seoul, that ability to bridge relationships, find that common ground is so, so critical. So shall we move ahead? So again, think about these orientations. The relationship is not necessary for the work. Sorry, the relationship is necessary to do the work. The task is separated from the person. Very different worldviews that, in fact, really can collide when you've got a timeline, when maybe you've spent money, when others are waiting and expecting product. And that's where really to be careful. Another way of looking at cultural difference has to do with low context and high context. Individual oriented. For those two guys who met in the coffee shop last, that night, this was their project. They were going to get it done. They were going to deliver it. It was them. Group oriented, a whole other way of looking at that. When we talked about Malaku's mom, maybe she had lots of other things going on. And so showing up at that exact time that the teacher had determined was not as important. Very different ways of expressing things. In developing Saving Face, we had mentioned earlier, and again, that piece, that's different. What does it mean to say no? Sometimes it's not said, and you've got to find ways to maneuver around it to see if the person who is really saying yes means otherwise. When we consider cross-cultural competencies, these really are soft areas. They're things that are just like driving the tractor trailer with this much snow. You know how to do it. You know whether you're in 14th gear or 17th gear, or really, really rather you should be in fifth gear, going really slow over that ice. You learn it as you do it. Sometimes, very much in university courses, we try to decipher it, stop, understand it, make theories about it, which sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of it has to do with just moving ahead, figuring it out, because you don't know who you're going to meet this evening or tomorrow morning, who may have lots of similarities to you, as well as then under that iceberg, there might be some good conflict going on. So with that, I very much want to thank you. Let us move ahead, whether it's with the Maasai students, who I did get to be with three weeks ago, or the Finnish students, who I was with four weeks ago. Very much, we have work to do as education diplomats in bridging the differences.